pause the broadcast. Don't yeah. press the red button okay. until the event's completed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is confusing. Okay, so we are live on the internet now. So keep that in mind. Yeah. <laughs> Step one in the camera. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you just pointed at whoever's talking. Mm -hmm. Is that it? I'll be back. All right, tell me what goes on and ask if I'm a part of this tonight. Hey, I'm. Because it just is. It's just how life is. Wait, can they hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can I hear you? Yeah, that's weird. Hey, I can see your, I can see your finger. Ah, oh, it disappeared. Now the camera's just jiggling. Ah, oh, there's your finger again. Oh, your finger's gone. You know what? The frames on this is like really slow. This camera is not synced up, bro. Also, oh, thank you. Well, you know, there's not to get that much. Okay, well, I can hear like everything I'm saying. You can. Yeah. Wait. Wait. Okay, where's Elvin? Wow. No, I just want to talk. Oh my. Oh my God. Yeah. Ah, oh, there's your finger. Is my voice? Yeah. Hey, Alvin. Is there a way that I can like, mute on this computer without messing with all that? Oh yes. Okay. So cool. what you want to do is you want to mute. And just mute it. Yeah, just mute it. I think. It's... I already did. Oh, you already did. Okay. Yeah. Okay, because I don't want everybody to hear all this. <sighs> oh, hey, it's the doctor. Yeah, I can feel it. Yeah, I know. I just don't want to hear it on this because it sounds horrible. I wonder if he could hear us, because it looks like he can't. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe we should say hello and then see what happens. Maybe he'll just be like Chelowski, Dr. Whatever your name is. Who are you talking about? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> The Quincy, this is how we had to communicate with the other people on the other side of the screen. <laughs> Maybe we should talk to how talk to him about politics. And lemonade sales. You just see him, man. Yeah. Very tired. <laughs> Wait, did they hear that? <laughs> it's very funny. It's fire. It does it like last time. It did the math. It did baby, 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 shut up. It's not gonna do it. Hey, Alvin, the screen went blank. Oh, it's all. Yeah, there it is. The quitty. The quitty. Blue. Why don't you? Why do you like have it in one place? Like move the camera around a couple times. Give them a feel of the room. Turn it that way. Alvin's butt is right there. Okay, now I'm looking at Alvin's butt. This is weird. God, I wouldn't take me out. Have to do this. <laughs> All right, okay. There's no reason I'm pointing at that side because you can't see anybody over there. I try to be racist. Yeah, just just keep it where it was. 
Oh my god. Hey, right there was fine. What you I got you right there. All right. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. You gentlemen are going to be responsible for saying a little bit about where the place is at and what we do. Here. So you decide what part you want to talk about. You decide what part you want to talk about. Fair enough. What do you mean, like, like, like you said, what is that? I can't, I can't. Yeah, right. Okay, just right. telling people what KI does. Oh, uh, okay. These two young men stand up, say your name, split it, what part you want? Um, I guess I'll talk about, like, the mission of KI, like, we are a nonprofit organization, da 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 da. Um, I'll talk about, like, the three different categories that we have here. Yeah. Sounds good. Who said my name? Uh, uh, and De Quincey, so we're going to tell you a little bit about what we do at the Kepler Institute. And if we can go around the room and introduce ourselves pretty briefly, there'll be time next week for long dissertation if you have one. But uh, who you are, who you with, and what inspires you to come out today. And after that, we'll have the illustrious launch of Sean DeCrow come up from the Spirit and Place uh, Festival who will uh, help to inspire. Um, hi, my name is Johnny Johnson. Uh, I'm an intern here at Gepper Institute. Um, KI. Hi, my name is Johnny Johnson. I'm 14 years old. I'm an intern at KI. Um, I usually help out with a lot of things right here, like video work, aquaponics, and urban ag team. Um, the mission of KI is that we are a nonprofit. We are a nonprofit organization that focuses on youth empowerment and self mastery. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. My, my name is Quincy Webster. Webster. I'm 16 years old. Um, I attend um, Washington High School. And, and a little bit about KI is it teaches most many different many things, things, but three of the most important things, things is. Uh, aquaponic uh, technology, technology and, uh, and uh, media. media. Uh, in the aquaponic uh, section, you just work with fish, fish plants, plants try and make uh, everything, everything work out together, together and that's how equal and everything. Uh, the, the technology, technology is the cameras and, and the way it's set up, uh, uh, for uh, very important people and stuff like that. Um, in media, not everyone can out on social media like Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or uh, social media nowadays kids use. Um, Hmm? Oh, we're in. Oh, we're in. Okay. I'm Leah. I'm um Black Lives Matter. I'm Lisa. Also, Black Lives Matter. I'm Lee. I'm an American artist with a video extension and part of the KX community. And I was inspired to come out today. All these conversations have been really good. 
have authentic and open conversations. My name is Sarah Carter. I was a new graduate from my new graduate class. I came around that day because I really like public my name is Jacqueline Kong. I'm a long time resident of Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, my community is um, the Bay Denny area, just, just south of Lucas Hall Stadium, where uh, Shapiro's is at. And we do have a neighborhood organization, but a lot of the talk is that we are the next found square. And in a lot of ways, I don't know what that means, and I don't want that to be near us without being really going to the So I'm here today to kind of put into our hands. I'm Steve Sullivan. I live in the urban area in the office. Starting 30 years ago. Um, I'm involved with um, IndyCan, Indianapolis Congregational Network, five or so churches of different denominations, working on social justice, community action issues. We got the Ban the Box uh, passed a year ago, so we've been on the jail this year. We're working on transportation, getting that passed. We've got the city council to vote to get on the ballot. Um, in November to have it so that hopefully enough people will vote. Raise taxes a little bit to get a much better transportation system in Indianapolis so that people who don't have good transportation can get money from. So I'm involved in community organizing community action. Uh, also, I retired from the Indiana Civil Rights Commission after 30 years of work. Um, I'm Brandon Randall, a parent involvement educator at School 57 in Irvington. Um, and Irvington has had its own issues with gentrification. Um, and then I live in Washington in a rural. Um, and so there's a bunch of work being done along East Washington Street right now. Um, so that's the information. Um, Colleen Pulte, I, uh, I live up the street and I work for a labor union right here. I got involved with Rebecca Butler, and so a lot of the people who refer, or all the people who refer to Butler here in the IPY, um, and some other things that are the closest in this neighborhood, um, are organized and have better jobs and live in the neighborhood. So. Hi, I'm doing the Midas Framework for my new uh, informatics. I'm from like the background area. So I've been kind of like witnessing like things kind of go on and stuff, and I'm about to be back in town, and I got email for this, and it seemed interesting, and I like having these discussions and stuff. So I'm happy to learn about it. I'm Terry Garcia. I'm, um, I work at Southwood Community Services in, in the Chapman Square neighborhood. Uh, we actually serve the whole southeast side, but we're watching this happen in Chapman Square, um, and it's not pretty. It's not, it's not good. So um, I just have to, so I'm here to try and figure out how to help the folks who are not part of the news broadly. <laughs> My name is Kimberly, I'm a psychologist, and I actually live in the digital Hi, I'm organization called Hip Hop Congress, a news organization for getting out in the community and how our organization can help our community and what our community involved in taking out information back with us and organization. My name is Desmond Sachs. I'm a local DJ and teacher at Deputy Dimmons. And um, I'm also representing the Minneapolis and Indiana chapter of the Congress. And I'm just here to talk about this for a second. We looked at Kevin uh, here to uh, learn more about the uh, challenges of gentrification and um, at some point maybe uh, focusing on uh, how communities can uh, mitigate uh, some of the impacts uh, that uh, 
current amount of miles it has on uh, uh, poverty and I am smart enough to allow education without just building on the people to live in the future. It seems like an argument to make me call up, but I think it's a big enough opportunity to pay somebody to take care of it. It's a spying, it's a good job. It seems like a more recent history, but it's not even more of a people's my name is Alvin St. Tuongle, and I work here with Kepper Institute um, and as well as Canon Media, which is one of our environmental enterprises. So I'm working with the young people here, Lindsay, John, and Moxley, uh, and uh, they're doing the live stream today. So if anyone could make it, the link is live.kepra.org. So that's how you get the live stream. Um, oh, I'm also a resident of the Northwest neighborhood. Uh, and a uh, similar challenge that we're looking at for the future, not to this point, but others might have a point for the future. Uh, yeah. um, <clears throat> Mr. Franklin, can you hear us? Or you have I can hear you. I can have a Okay, did you get the, the, link, the link I sent you to the live stream? The audio is better on that link. So, okay. I can take a minute to see if and the picture will be better too, because we got a camera that's actually shooting for people. Um, so, uh, try that out. Keep uh, Tell me about coming back. Would you like to introduce yourself and start with this thing? We'll be on the road um, for the day. Um, my name is Nalde, and I'm from the west side of Minneapolis, and I'm um, a federal point of view. I'm just kidding. 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 I'm just
blocks in North. And so my block is there, I'm going to have to get It's like there's the middle of the block and one side of the block is a totally different community and the other block is a different community. And then when we look at them, we look across the street, we definitely set some of the new activities that are happening that are going to lead to massive change. Lots of them, lots of them we've talked about with Patrick at Fountain Square, so we can give you an idea what it looks like. In 2010, Fountain Square is working for work at 31000 2015, they're now estimated $135,000. So that's a $100,000 change. It's a tax exchange. So what happens to the individuals who are no longer able to pay taxes becomes a question that has to be discussed because we don't live in a community that actually has any kind of tax tax as they So this conversation today is the one of most America's most taboo conversations, which is always about how does race, class, and power play into the context of literally all aspects. It does impact such expectations for today. Let's have a discussion about that. We have two guest speakers in the video. We have Major Neil Franklin uh, from Left uh, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Uh, I heard him speak about two months ago. It was absolutely fascinating. He talked about the impact of the war with drugs on our communities. And if you're in this area, you know that you know, he's definitely been devastated in some aspect uh, about the war. We also have uh, Sandy Booth from Child Advocates, who runs the Unfair Racism Workshop. She's a little bit late, but she is on her way here. And they've been running, they've been running about 15 of those in the end of that month, uh, training individuals on really understanding what structural racism looks like and how it can work to change that. So she'll be here shortly. And we can get started with our first video, which is called Race Gating on the Board, which will kind of set the foundation of understanding how we are we want to turn the issue of racial context. Turn my this mic to the live stream mic. Thank you. And then turn this one all the way up. Okay, so can they hear me now? No, it's only through that mic. Okay, thank you. stereotypes expressed in the 17th and 18th centuries, the vile and brutish parts of mankind, the marks of the alien race. Those were how the gentleman class described whites, poor whites to be exact, from Europe, many of whom were duped by a conge who promised an all expense paid trip to the new world in return for years of free labor on the other side. Then there were those sentenced to work for five to seven years of forced labor. In the 1700s alone, there were 50,000 documented white men and women were shipped to the colonies and auctioned off as labor for crimes, from petty theft to trespassing and pickpocketing. A slave was considered unfortunate, not inferior. To become a slave in the ancient world was not based on skin color, but the result of being on the losing side of the war. White indentured servants 400 years ago were seen as more or less the same as African slaves. They also made easy alliances, raging against greed, unfair taxes, oppressive land use regulations. And in the 1670s, one of those alliances nearly burned Jamestown to the ground. And the last to surrender were 100 men, an black and 20 white. And a law enforcement system was created to give whites slightly more privileges and force a separation in their contact with blacks. This three-tiered caste system, blacks on the bottom, poor whites a notch above, now treated more favorably, made them feel as though one day they might improve their status if they just worked hard enough. Maybe some did, most did not, especially as the life expectancy was about 35. As all rights and freedoms were taken from Africans, this new racial caste system protected the wealthy landowners, who in the South would soon become known as the masters. And if you're interested in reading more about this, there's a page-turning thriller, not exaggerating, called The People's History of the United States, which you can download as an audiobook to support this series. The creation of that three-tiered caste system is the moment the modern institution of racial slavery is born which would brutalize, divide, and crush the spirits of black men, women, and children for the next 200 years, and give many poor whites the idea mm. that though their lives might be miserable, at least they weren't black. <laughs> Until 1863. And as Michelle Alexander writes in The New Jim Crow, former slaves had a brief moment in the sun before they returned to a state akin to slavery or worse. The unprecedented economic might of the new United States 
built on the backs of an enormous free slave labor force, would arguably be the single greatest factor contributing to what would soon become the world's largest modern superpower. And in gratitude, instead of helping freed slaves find homes, reunite with families, or help anyone, at the very least, heal from a 300-year-old trauma, they were largely neglected by the North faced rampant disease, outbreaks of smallpox, cholera, many starved to death, and for the next 100 years, this thing called Jim Crow just took over for slavery. Enforced by government, courts, and law officers, forcing a continuation of an already well-established racial caste system on every aspect of American life. Ministers said whites were the chosen people, blacks cursed to be servants, God supported racial segregation, craniologists, eugenicists, phrenologists, and social Darwinists at every educational level reinforced the belief that blacks were in every way inferior to whites. Massive social disadvantages compounded by predatory lending and housing markets and legally regulating blacks in the ghettos, discriminatory bank lending practices, severe job discrimination, and delusional pensions all continued until the 1960s. Now we're only talking 50 years ago. We finally have the civil rights act. Black nationalism and black power, black pride. For the first time, a public promise of opportunity after three centuries of the opposite. Communities getting to police their own streets, but the black pride forces are soon struck down by the law and order. And what takes the place of what was once called Jim Crow? The invention of the largest prison industry in the world, in the form of new laws, tougher laws, more laws, longer sentences, mandatory more prisons, more police, and the barbaric war on drugs, which should be called the war on people. When blacks are far more likely to be arrested for selling and possessing drugs than whites, even though whites use drugs at the same rate, and are actually more likely to sell drugs. Blacks who've committed the exact same crimes as whites are more likely to be arrested, prosecuted, more likely to have longer prison sentences. Families deprived of breadwinners and once again deprived of the right to vote. Generations sentenced to a revolving door in and out of a prison system so unstoppable that one out of three black men born today can expect to go to prison in their lifetime. And so despite the existence of so many notable, heroic, black, brown, and white cops saving lives and rescuing victims from unimaginable horrors across the country, righteous lawyers, wise judges, and honest legislators doing great things that cannot and should never be overlooked. Overall, black America has never seen a substantive break in law enforcement service to larger forces ever on the wrong side of history. <laughs> Policing for petty regulatory violations like failure to use a turn signal or lacking a front license plate. And so here we are today. 30% of America are minorities. That represents 60% of the prison population. Over 1 million men and women. And so the majority of black America, 70%, understandably, have little trust in law enforcement and the criminal justice system. But don't be fooled. This prison industrial complex has not only swept up the black women, but all people of limited means, hunting minorities and the poor, at rates higher than any other on the planet. This thing grew bigger than anyone could have imagined. All of its limited hunting is still and aggression. As we have seen, it's really a significant trouble. All the minorities out of the equation, we knew only the white majority, we would still be over incarcerated. We would still have vile police brutality. We would still have a criminal justice system desperately in need of reform. So, just like the days of early slavery, today we still have a three tiered system. With notable exceptions, slightly more than half of black Americans graduate from high school, compared to three quarters of white Americans. And black males are twice as likely to be unemployed as white males. Moving on to the second tier, we have poor whites. She did the second worst as a whole, with many more notable exceptions, so many of them wasn't the case. White America is also in very bad shape. The real poverty rate for the U.S. as a whole is staggeringly close to 50%. We have a myth of social mobility that is one of the worst in the industrialized world due to decades of disinvestment from communities sending cheap labor overseas, leaving depressed, isolated local economies with no jobs, a dwindling tax base, and nothing to attract business or new residents. And why is this? As the great journalist Emily Cleese says, we should never say the word poverty without the words inequality and injustice being. People will become poor, not by personal failing, but because the system is engineered to keep them down. Yet despite numerous horrific incidents of police brutality and criminal injustice against whites, the beating of a homeless man or horse thief to 
near death or to death, with a million unprecedented in our the majority of whites today, 57%, still have quite a lot, or a great deal of confidence in police, and the majority of the justice system is fair. The poor whites and victims of criminal injustice and inequality are spread out across the country and heavily divided by culture and politics. The so called liberal or conservative news media is owned by six mega media companies that control information. Those companies are owned by the very rich. According to Forbes, the 400 wealthiest Americans today have more money than the poor half of the entire population of the United States. While less than 4% of our entire country are millionaires, they make up over half the members of Congress. Who do you think millionaires represent? The elite who run the country in a different revolving door of economic royalty have demonstrated certainly that they are above prosecution. So with a news media that mostly reports only on the black outrage of police brutality, which is and has been at a boiling point for the last 300 years, the white majority is confused. They make all kinds of assumptions, and the white minority were aware of the horrors of the criminal injustice system, but unaware of the history of black America feel themselves being lumped in with the elites. When they scream at Al Sharpton or Jesse Jackson and call them race leaders, they're right to scream, but they're screaming at the wrong faces. The media is terrified to let the mass of Americans know the truth about our three-tiered caste system alive and well and keeping us divided. Why do I need to identify with those ancestors before me who committed genocide and not only enslaved, but brutalized the people who in chains and in struggle for civil rights created and inspired some of the greatest art, music, culture, writing, ideas, invention, and humanity the world has ever seen. I identify with being part of that struggle. I don't need to be proud of my blood because the same color red gives life to us all. I don't need to be proud of the color of my skin because I was never told I needed to be ashamed of it. True shame is only for those who have hate in their hearts, and that can be healed. I don't need to be proud of my religion because all the great religions warn us against pride. I am privileged to be a white, straight male in a society that favors those traits for which I had nothing to do with. Favors I might not even know I had. I grew up poor. There were a few years I was homeless, but I did not grow up black. And I was blessed in my childhood to see the difference. <laughs> to paraphrase Van Jones, even in a hoodie, I look less like Trayvon than I do like Mark Zuckerberg. So along the way, informing my identity as a human being, I choose to identify with all of humanity in a struggle for harmony. You are my ally and I am yours. I don't need to be better than someone else to feel good about myself. I need to feel the same. I acknowledge racism as existing and alive as it ever was, and in doing so, I eliminate any invented wall between us. When we ally ourselves with a movement that's been asking to just acknowledge for four odd centuries how overdue it is to just say three words, Black Lives Matter, then united, we are a power that will shake the masters to their core. Yes, I say masters of the global economy that exploits not only our own nation but the entire planet, the masters of the commercial news, the military industrial complex, prison complex the overwhelming majority of the government, the masters corrupted by the influence too much power has on all human beings. For injustice and inequality are one and the same. Black, brown, white, sisters, brothers. The class struggle unites us all, as it always has. And race feeders who are exposed. Uh, before we uh, continue us live in the circle, we're going to Good job. Hit,
that population people. And we move forward in time, going to the early 1900s, we saw this same type of control, again with uh, blacks in, in, in the United States and Mexicans. So again, um, you know, we were moving from uh, Mexicans were in the southwest part of the country, um, uh, beginning to take jobs and, and opportunities, and you know, so we started in the country criminalized marijuana, we criminalized uh, heroin. Heroin used to be legal at one time. All these drugs used to be legal at one time. You could buy an ounce of heroin, which was made by the Bear Company, uh, for two dollars and eighty-five cents in your local drugstore. Um, but if you if you have time, uh, Google uh, um, Harry Anslinger, who we consider our first drug czar of the country. Um, Google uh, Harry Anslinger and Randolph Hearst, who was a newspaper conglomerate, they teamed up um, to push these all even further. And if you read some of the newspapers from back then, which were controlled by the Randolph Hearst company, um, you'll see some of the terminology that was used regarding the degenerate races as they talked about blacks and Mexicans uh, in this country and the, the drugs that they used to use and the need to criminalize these drugs and so on. But let's jump forward really quick here to the late 60s and the early 70s with the uh, Richard Nixon administration. Um, and look at where he coined the phrase the, the, of the war on drugs, which is really war. Um, there is a gentleman by the name of Dan Baum, who had, uh, and that's B A U M, who had interviewed one of Nixon's. Uh, Close's advisor, once he got out of federal prison because of Watergate, so he did this interview, I think, in the 1990s, about 1994, of John Ehrlichman. And during this interview of Ehrlichman, Ehrlichman clearly stated that the war on drugs launched by the Nixon administration was basically about controlling the hippies in the country who were protesting the Vietnam War, which was a, a pain in the butt for Richard Nixon at the time. And he was also dealing with this, with the uh, civil rights movement of the 60s, and that, of course, was blacks. And he said, well, you know, basically, if we criminalize marijuana use and strongly criminalize the use of heroin, then we can control these two groups of people by vilifying them on late night TV. Uh, we could get into their homes, we could uh, disrupt their organization by conducting raids and, and so on, and that's exactly what they did. Uh, Ehrlichman clearly stated in this interview that it was never about the problem of drug use, but it was about controlling two groups of people. It was never about drug use. I just want to point out, through history, over the past more than 100 years, the clear evidence of how drug policies are used control certain groups of people both economically and um, different groups racially. Um, and you tie that to gentrification, you see, because when you criminalize, when you prohibit these drugs, you know, in our, our inner city communities and our black communities, especially when jobs are no longer available, cities like Baltimore, Chicago, and most of the major cities across this country back in the 1960s, you had plenty of blue collar jobs that something an outsource. So real quickly, Baltimore went from a blue-collar steel industry business or, or, or city, you know, with a fairly heavy shift trade uh, with companies like General Motors and Western Electric, plenty of blue-collar jobs, people didn't even need high school educations. And today, Baltimore, because of Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland hospital system, is pretty much a biopharm. So you need at least a four-year degree, if not more, to be gainfully employed in cities like Baltimore. And for those neighborhoods that had employed so many blue-collar, very low-educated folks, whose families were solid, um, uh, you know, the, the, they were tightly knit uh, communities and neighborhoods, 
You look at these communities today, and they're vacant homes, boarding up homes, uh, property values have greatly declined, uh, crime is off the hook, again, because of the prohibition of drugs. So you have very little employment opportunities, but you can make a lot of money very quickly by selling drugs, and that's what people do. People will do what they need to do to survive. So literally, you take, you remove the jobs from such communities, and then you, you insert the opportunity to make a lot of money through illegal activity, unfortunately, and now you've begun to criminalize this population of people within these communities and neighborhoods. And just so you understand what has happened regarding the criminalization of these communities, in the United States in the late 1960s when we began all this, we were arresting about, oh, 400,000 people a year. Uh, they were arresting millions a year. As a matter of fact, um, in 19, we averaged about 475,000 arrests all across this country. Today, today, we have arrested 52 million people. Um, we have, and most of these people that were criminalizing by race are black people, brown people, and poor people living in these urban communities, again, where the jobs have been left. And um, we, as law enforcement, have been used to go in and to criminalize great uh, populations of people. Um, with that, uh, property prices go down. Property becomes available, people buy up the property, and if it's not Johns Hopkins University and Johns Hopkins Medical System in Baltimore buying up all this real estate on the east side, you know, it's, it's individual people who take advantage of buying up the property. And before you know, you have a whole block or two blocks that you own, you rebuild, you tear the flexes, and when new people move in, uh, they're not the same people. They don't look like the same people who used to inhabit those communities. Um, there's a lot more to this, but I just wanted to open up real quick in my, in my 10 minutes to talk a little bit about the connection of the war on drugs being used as a tool to basically drive down property prices, clear out neighborhoods, and make those neighborhoods available at a very, very reduced rate for those who want to come in and pretty much change the complexion of the community. Cindy, sorry, Cindy uh, missed her plane exchange, so she's not going to be here until way after we uh, we end. But she's going to come back later, so we've so, got five more of these. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our. Uh, Feature facilitator over there, Wise Logic, great man. man. Uh, you got here a little late to dance, so stay a little about who you are and uh, the rules. The rules for engagement in this discourse today. Uh, I'm Wise, uh, community educator here. Uh, also, I teach down the street at the School for Community Learning. Pretty much, like this. Uh, pretty much want to try to get everybody's voice to be heard. Um, we're going to open it up to close for discussion on that. Everybody going to jump in? Okay. So we're asking like, hey, where's everybody? Just everybody. Okay. okay. Um, so like now, it's like, I don't know, it seems like back then there was people actively pulling these strings. And now, is it more like, are there people behind the scenes making this happen, or is it more like, the system is in place and we just have to kind of fix it because like this is like really evil stuff i'm just curious like who are these people who are like making these choices and like you know making these things happen and yeah is that still going on today or is it more like you just have to be able to that well, is that a question for everybody or yeah anyone or anyone else? i mean you may want to repeat that okay did you uh, hear that question Mr. Franklin, did you hear that question? I did not hear that question. And there's a, I can hear it through the streaming, but there's a lag, so I'm just getting it through the streaming. Okay, no problem. 
So go ahead and go ahead and you repeat it. Uh, Alvin, I can hear you when you talk because you're closer to the uh, microphone. So just repeat it for me. Okay, yeah, come on. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious, like as a police officer and stuff, like I'm just seeing it. Like I'm curious, who is like pulling these strings and like who are making these decisions? Where they're just like can be aware of this, and now is it still people who are getting aware of this, or is it just like we have to kind of clean up the mess that's already been from the past? Um, when it comes to like the war on drugs and like these policies. Give me a second, I'm gonna listen to it on the screen, but it's still clear. Now, it was still a little problematic, even on the streaming. I heard something about police officers. Yeah, so I'll, I'll paraphrase. Um, so the, the question was, in your experience as a police person, you know, a lot of this stuff seems really bad, nasty, and evil. So uh, from your perspective, who is pulling the strings, um, whether it's behind the scenes or in power that's, that's uh, making all these things happen? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. So, um, from my perspective, I think a big problem here is uh, politically, as far as pulling the strings. And, you know, our police officers, even though I criticize them at the drop of a hat, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's so many things that we, the police, do inappropriately, even, even, even from policies that we're operating under. Um, but the problem really is the policy that the police have to enforce, or at least that they're charged with enforcing. Um, whether it's our drug laws, whether it's the, the, the work that they do in our schools, where we see a lot of inappropriate and aggressive behavior and, and excessive force. Um, the policies, we seem to give our police <coughs> to do that where we as society don't want to have to live. You know, most of the problems that we have in society um, are issues that can be resolved at the community level. Um, even to the point of many of our minor crimes that are being committed, they can be resolved at the community level through restorative justice models and so on. But it's, it's a lot of work. You know, your communities have to work well. Your families have to be healthy and whole in order for that to happen. And we don't want, we seem not to want to do this work. So, for instance, our drug policies, we need to have policies of regulation and control for these drugs. Because currently we're trying to solve a public health problem with criminal <coughs> justice solutions. And that's our police, courtrooms, and prisons. And it doesn't work. Um, just take a look at how we're dealing with the use and problems with tobacco use. Tobacco consumption kills about 400,000 people a year, but we're not criminalizing people for using what we're doing. We're educating people, social influence, treatment, and that's how we're able to reduce the consumption of problematic use with tobacco products. We need to do the same thing with drugs as well, and some of the other things that we've charged the police with doing. Education is first, then treatment as it relates to a number of things. So, you know, again, um, I just want to say that we need to get, we need to dump on our, our brain and ensure that when they want to pass new policies, you know, to criminalize someone or particular activity, we need to take a really good look at so what long term are the results? What are the consequences? of us passing certain policy. And we need to do the hard work and then if it, if it doesn't look good, then we need to say to our policymakers, no, we don't want it. But unfortunately, not many of us are completely engaged or engaged enough in our political processes and systems to know very little bit, if anything, about the bills that are being generated and then passed in our state and local legislatures and uh, on Capitol Hill. So we need to get more involved so we know exactly what's happening in that level. Uh, 
I would argue the policy are working. Policies have been designed to do what also just said, which is about social control and also at the end of the day, profit. If you talk about the cigarette company, the cigarette company knew that cigarettes kill people. And they stood in front of and attempted to prevent any kind of responses that led to uh, control of the cigarette uh, industry uh, in this country. So even to the point of, of, uh, of policy control, science control, and uh, legal <coughs> control of the political process, New Jim Crow, same thing. So uh, for the most part, the political process is linked directly to the profit process which has nothing to do with uh, healthy people, et cetera. If you take the drug challenge and the issue of uh, opiate addiction and increasing heroin in our communities, that's tied to uh, what happened to the prescription industry, which is also tied to the profit industry. So you got large amounts of folks addicted on prescription drugs because of, 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 of loose uh, uh, legislation, loose control, driven around uh, 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 profit. Now, then I'm trying to make this as clear as I can. Gentrification really is a subset of that particular phenomenon. It's a global economic phenomenon that has one goal and one goal only. How much money can I make? And at maximum money for least cost, uh, regardless of its cost to, to, to human beings, etc. Those on the other side of that, folks, in the community, we're trying to bring about change. Yeah, we it, it, we, we are challenged to, to rise uh, to not drink the Kool Aid, uh, to try to look beyond the uh, <laughs> uh, the wizard and look more deeply at what it, what's the cause of this. So what happens with, with gentrification? Then often uh, when when under the label of revitalization on uh, community economic development, that's all about money. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, 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 and a model that puts people last, if at all, mm -hmm. uh, and and so then we're told, oh, a little bit of gentrification is good for you. Oh, well, it's too early to talk about gentrification because these community communities are uh, uh, population that decrease. Uh, there's no economic development in those communities. But no discussion or look at, well, how did this happen? Why are there disenfranchisement in those communities? What happened to business in those communities? What happened to those people in the communities? And so then we're told that, well, it's because we have not done enough. We don't have enough education. We don't understand how the process works. And while some of that very well may be true, and we do have to take some responsibility and empower ourselves to bring about change, we have to begin to take a critical critique of what are the driving factors and forces that lead to this, this initiative. Lastly, particularly in the Midwest, you have uh, a cities that are under stress, large amounts of economic stress to try to figure out how do we re-establish a tax base to provide infrastructure to communities. It's a legitimate concern, it's a challenge, uh, but it's driven through a model that's actually controlled by forces outside the city. So most of the folks we then inter interface with who are really gatekeepers, intentionally or unintentionally, for uh, uh, infrastructure that drives a particular model down our throats, down our throats, mm -hmm. uh, because of its own struggle to sustain its death and survive. And that's either, either at the organizational level or, or even uh, broader than that. So folks are trying to hold on to their job that are tied to this model. Uh, and so then they keep pushing the same thing through. Even the approach used for our housing development. Uh, the, the tax credit model might be this flaw. I think <coughs> the tax credit is crack cocaine for developers. Let me get some more of that. Let me get some more of that. Now that's not the hate on developers, but that whole model is driven around a particular approach to development that at the end of the day is going to lead to gentrified communities, higher levels of poverty, and, and more uh, um, 
uh, more displacement, all kind of displacement. A lot of times you talk about this case, this place is set up. Well, nobody thinks this place, nobody lives here. That's one of the main arguments. This place, this case is not just about people. It's also called from the social. You know, I look up and I'm sitting out drinking a Budweiser on the front porch. Then I look around, there's a dog park that's got food. That's a different kind of displacement. That's a cultural social displacement that makes me feel uncomfortable. So when we talk about gentrification, we cannot allow others to define that term for us. This is what it means to us, and this is that. So I think part of our discourse has to be a critique of the model, a critique of existing tools to do economic development. Not to toss them out, but to be clear of what they can and cannot do. And then we're challenged as a community to look at some alternative models, alternative solutions that will put people first and build it second, if not last. So that's my speech. And I definitely legalize the drugs. Speech, but you know, I'm always about um, one who are over 40, 50, 60, and 70. <laughs> we we kind of we see, see this coming along in our lifetime, especially those of us who came through uh, the civil rights era, which spawned the women's rights era, which spawned. So there are quite a few uh, social groups who had issues accessing general <coughs> culture and resources and moving through society, those groups started to get that like with civil rights, they started to get these these, these mandated access, mandated uh, laws came down. And all of a sudden, all of us have started to see that pendulum that went way left and gave all these rights and access and fields and policies that work for People just a massive. How about that pendulum and snatch it back here? We look so okay, so 10% of permanent action. Oh, all right. Well, you know, public housing, you know, okay, people do need to work. Next thing you know, it's all over there. And developers come in the community, bring those dollars, give it to everybody but the people who live there. And so I'm just saying, in the present, I feel like a lot of wonderful things can happen. But I say, somebody put a spade in the ground. Who in this community is also having an advantage? Institutions come in with paid staff. They've underwritten some part of it. They pick the developers. The developers come in with their people. Nobody comes in with the community. Next thing we know, they put this gorgeous, beautiful, whatever it is, in the middle of our community, they disappear with every shoe box sandwich in the community. And don't drop a dime in there. Mm. And we all sit down and we're talking about what happened. And then the next thing we know, and, and it's not about you don't want new people to move into your neighborhood. I mean, you know, how, much, how many of us have welcomed to new neighbors? It's not about not having new people, it's about Rape and pillage in the very neighborhoods that they got the money for all kinds of things in other places. You just don't need to go to this property, just go to the other people. But it just takes that back. So I'm just saying, I'm talking about all this wonderful oversight stuff. So right now, if somebody says something about putting something in my neighborhood, the first thing I'm going to say is, how does it address? Poverty and equity today. Before you take the first poll, today. So you know that's where I'm. I'm. I hope that all of us won't feel like the infrastructure. The gentleman said, "How did this all happen?" That infrastructure is in place. You see it dropping in Baltimore. I see it south of Twenty Fifth and um, Meridian. I live at Twenty Fifth. And Bovard Place, which is just two blocks over one, I know they are coming from a neighborhood. <laughs> but the issue is what if you call it the one person 
you know, to, to reach for others, to ask the question, to at least stop the bulldozer as the word gets out about the project. So I'm saying that yes, there is an infrastructure is strong, it's in place. The gatekeepers in our neighborhoods, the ones who have the fiduciary responsibility, these neighborhood associations and big time leaders in our neighborhoods, people who don't know the fiduciary responsibility is when someone comes to them and says, these are the plans that they stop and say. Poverty, equity, and policy being addressed. If, if, if your plan is talking about in five years, there'll be some jobs for, for others. Um, I think one of the issues um, that bothers me is that there's a lack of uh, community investment in a lot of these projects, like the, uh, what are the, the blue Indy cars or what are the, the, the cars you can rent, the electric cars. Um, I feel like they showed up overnight, um, and, but they're, and they're placed in areas that is kind of like why are they here? Yeah. Like I said, I live in Washington in a rural um, in the Commonwealth, and overnight they put a string of them um, right there, just um, north of Washington in a rural. Um, there's some on Washington and near Washington and Linwood, um, and they're they're in areas that it makes you think, which how much that project cost, and if they would have taken that money and invested it in those areas, or even a ask the people who live in those areas, you know, we have this amount of funding or money for this project. How would you actually like to see that money spent? I uh, mean, the bike share program, um, you know, if you rent one of those yellow bikes, I don't know how much they cost, but if you forget to bring them back, that is, is very expensive. And I feel like that's mobile gentrification because uh, they never, you know, it's, it's not accessible to everybody. And so just looking at how the strings that you were talking about, you know, whether it's the mayor's office or, you know, the governor or whoever, you know, who is asking community residents, what would you like to see in your neighborhood? And I don't think I ever got a survey on if we wanted to know about a blue car. Because instead of, we could have used some more street lights on okay. Washington in the rural, uh, which I know that they're talking about lifting that uh, moratorium that they have it already. Uh, but I didn't even know there was a moratorium. Uh, we got all these cars, but we don't have lights. We don't have repair sidewalks. Uh, 46201 is one of the highest zip codes for abandoned houses. So you pay a million dollars in the blue cars, and that's probably a very low figure. And you invest that and make um, affordable housing to people who already live in the 46201 neighborhood, that's more beneficial instead of putting these rental cars and bikes in my neighborhood. Hi, my name is George. I'm new to this area here of um, gentrification. Uh, I'm selling board director for the Center. I've done a lot of public work. But one of the things that I see is that I hear people talk about my power and when I hear power I hear knowledge and what I don't see is people getting knowledge and that goes back to education mm -hmm. and so if people get education then they understand the process and if you understand the process then you can change not understanding how the game works you're never going to change okay so um policy usually comes from politicians the politicians are people that I usually trust to do anything for my benefit. So policy is something that I usually don't trust. Um, if I look at policy, I see things like academia, there's academic policy. That's a bunch of bull. I mean, it's the miseducation of America. If I go to school, I'm going to learn what somebody wants me to know. That's all I'm ever going to learn. If I go to church, okay, we'll talk about from my Judeo-Christian perspective. If I go to church, I'm going to learn even less than I learned in school, okay? So I can't depend on the church to say, okay, 
these are the issues, and this is the way they're going to be fixed. I have two eyes, two ears, two nostrils. I can smell as well as probably better than I can see. If it doesn't smell right, then I need to say, hey, you know what? This is a fish. This is not chicken, okay? <laughs> this does not smell right. When we talk about fixing our neighborhoods, development goes back in this country all the way to Europeans coming here and giving white people something that was called a head right, okay? If I was the head of the household, I was entitled to 40 acres. I had to be a man, of course. I was entitled to 40 acres. Just a white man. Am I talking too loud? No. Okay, so it, it didn't start in the 60s. It didn't start in the 50s. This thing was designed for white people to benefit from the very beginning. And the only way it can happen is because they came in here with big, bad, what do you call those things? Weapons. Oh, yeah. Big, bad weapons that were better than, uh, you know, bows and arrows. And said, hey, you want what you got. Now, you know what my answer is here? All of us need at least five guns. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, we need to self-educate. We need to understand that policy has never fixed anything. Policy creates the problem and then creates a solution. And when the solution is all out there on the, on, on the table, there are going to be certain groups of people who are going to suffer. Academia, religion, you know, uh, all that stuff. None of that's going to fix it. It's, it's a, you know, it's a community issue. I got wild stuff. I got you. Um, a wild stuff. I didn't introduce myself earlier. Who the hell are you there in this problem? Oh, my bad. My name is <laughs> <laughs> my name is my name is Sybil Satterfield. I am a part of a growing in a, a venture in the Riverside neighborhood called Street Feet Street Side Market. I also hold the uh, job title of, of Chief Contrarian uh, here at AI. <laughs> All right, um, I'm Wild Scout. I live literally just on the other side of the cemetery, so I walked over here today. Um, to talk about gentrification and education uh, going hand in hand is, in my opinion, a little naive. Uh, gentrification is, I don't think there's any, well, there, there are even people in the world. We all know that, but a lot of people aren't involved in gentrification because they're evil. They're involved in gentrification because they need to earn a living. They need to make money. And when you can go in and get tax credits for this and, and get grants for that and, and everything else, uh, as a developer, as a construction company, consultant, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and, and, and many of the nonprofits uh, you know, that are dependent upon all this to, to keep their not for profit open. And to pay your salaries that eventually sometimes we cut corners when, when it becomes you know it becomes less about the people of the neighborhood and more about keeping money in our pockets keeping uh, the organization open keeping it funded and for the not you know for the profit people to make put more money in their pockets and the issue isn't um it isn't like one person, one person pulling these strings, and it's not necessarily education that's going to let you know who's pulling all these strings. The process is flawed. I mean, fundamentally, it's it's flawed. You you can go to, I mean, you can get as many degrees as you want, probably a political science, and it's not going to tell you which organization in your neighborhood is really sold out the community and decided that. Uh, uh, my best friends are developers, and I want them to develop this this area, irregardless of its effects on residents. That there's no school for them. So I mean, you know, the the link it all to education is a little naive. I mean, there's been a, a, a situation in Indianapolis where money has been recommended spending spending uh, spent to an outside organization outside of the community without a whole lot of the community's knowledge and none of these were elected officials that actually made this recommendation and uh, you know education isn't always going to tell you exactly how that process worked or, or give you access to people involved in that so 
That's just my story. Um, I heard the term urban colonialism being attributed to gentrification, and I think that really indicates a lot of the, the tactics of divide and conquer. I am an Asian American. I'm um, my parents are from India, so I am directly affected by colonialism. My grandparents more so. So then I see the similarities of how certain groups and social classes are divided and pit against each other. And in the race baiting video, we saw how before, the reason why poor whites were elevated was because there was a danger in poor whites aligning uh, align themselves with black, people, uh, black slaves. And so we see a lot of these policies aimed at that. You see policies that are trying to divide and conquer, and you see that even within the black community, once you get educated, the term of respectability politics and how that affects um, the unity of communities. And it's a lot easier to take over a space when they're not united. And so a lot of, I think, when we talk about gentrification and high agents, gentrification, it's also important to see how we can unite, more specifically from my perspective, of how we Asian Americans can unite with other immigrants, black people, who are white, to stop gentrification. Yeah. 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 Uh, <coughs> the, uh, I guess for me, as I listen to the discourse, uh, maybe even defining what the word education means is important. Uh, George, President George here, uh, is on the board. I do think it's important to understand how these boards work, how the how, how government works, and for us to uh, have enough understanding about how these processes work to influence and, uh, when possible, uh, uh, redirect uh, those uh, those initiatives to better service of our community. Uh, now, if we've been miseducated, often the case, uh, and by that I mean when we allow our understanding of what's going on to be defined by others, and often school systems from K through PhD, then we have been trained and educated to implement uh, the tools of power uh, to, to do these kinds of things. What then happens often, uh, particularly with the professional class, uh, not all of the professional class, but, but, but many, uh, then uh, find themselves in positions of power to that and believe that they're doing good work for community. Um, but they're actually just uh, uh, doing their math and bidding. So uh, part of that then is we have to regain control of the educational process. But that's nothing more than what we're doing here. To, to critique and take it apart. Tell us more about drug policy and how that works for us. And then uh, create uh, infrastructure within our community that allow us to impact and bring about the change we want and have enough understanding that all tools aren't the same, all tools aren't going to have the same outcome. And uh, but that, 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 would, that would be my take on the education. Mm -hmm. And I do want, I agree with Wildstyle. Often one of the big challenges is that the boogeyman just happens to be on the only train in town going the wrong way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I also know that some of you have a little bit of So I encourage that uh, most of the especially uh, engaging the dialogue too. I don't want to, I know I don't want to I won't say anymore, man. I'm not very profound, but I encourage you. I'm done, I got to do it. We're going to have two minutes left, and we're going to have another minute. I'm going to go over and whisper in George if I want to hear something. I'm going to say something else to George. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Johnny uh, well, I, I think you know, like this is an important part, but like people who should be here are, you know, people who are the developers who are coming into the communities. And 
We want to build these places in the malls and Whole Foods places and food stores should be attending these meetings and finding out. And now I know it'll never happen, but you know, my view of if we could have some kind of policy, policy but like a law that said like if you want to develop, you have to go into the community and talk to each individual person who lives there and ask them what they need before you are allowed to build something. And that would really decrease the number of people who would be coming in and uh, building outside of the community. But, you know, that money makes the world go round. And, uh, but, I don't know, this is some idea of, like, have some requirement in the people who are trying to do these yeah, building ventures. It's a check on their power that says, hey, you know, you have to pass this with people that are going to be there for your building this. Or you have to involve people in the community when you're going to develop something by law. Otherwise, you get penalized. Um, okay. I really have a question. Um, so, um, I kind of get along side of tools and solutions. And so I'm I'm looking like for some things that on both sides of the equation. So on one side, a practical solutions to the bad fish behavior through the current process that man made really kind of a whole lot of things of that nature. That's one side. But then the other side is what type of tools are out there that can develop that actually begin to change the culture because the processes come from the culture of the people. So basically, what are things that are being done currently, either locally, globally, etc., on both sides of the fence to change the tide of the water? Um, I just wanted to speak from a teacher's perspective about the education system. I heard a lot of people talking about the education change for education system. In the education, there is a misinformation, and I 100% agree with them being a teacher because being a teacher teaching social studies, you have to spend a lot of time to teach in the classroom. So it may be true that you may not be able to teach because your job may be trying to teach something that is kind of on the border of what people don't want. It's almost it's sad because it shows you that they really don't want kids to know the truth about a lot of things in history. So like I, I definitely understand what you all are saying about that. But my question was like, what do you all think would be the answer to solve this solution? Because obviously, like we would have to go and read through the whole education system. Oh, and actually rewrite our history because the history that we teach in the classroom, a lot of teachers teach in the classroom is not true. Or a lot of <coughs> important history is not in the textbook. The very important history is not true. And it should be very well to be there because, but it's not fair. We're talking about fair, not fair. But that's my question. What do you all think the answer? And I forgot your name, but uh, you said something about in a community about uh, before they come in and do the transportation if they ask everyone. Oh. My, my response is that that would mean that they're actually doing it because they care about the community and not just trying to make money for the other way around. They people come, they want they have a the idea that they want to make money, then they think about okay, well how can I apply this to the community so they can do the program instead of saying, Hey, I want to go help the community. Let me go see what they want to do, and then we'll go from there, and then we'll just always all these jobs around. Make money, see how we can get these people to believe us that we're going to help them, and then we'll act like we care. We care about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I define education as a formal and informal process. Formal process and the informal process that the parents do. You know, keep them explaining to another, keep them with right and wrong and being fair. That's pretty much.
Well, I guess I think, and I think uh, I heard you know, what people should do. And I think I read somewhere that I'm trying to be young, young, and black people came and you should do this, that, and the other. He said, you may be right, but don't make me do it. So my feeling is that, you know, we all have a sense that this is wrong, or we know it's wrong, or upset, or angry. But the question is, you know, what are we going to do in terms of one to learn about the process and where we can impact those and like Diop said what are alternative models and there are alternative models out here and how do we you know work together to try to get so it's pressure from pressure to change policy if that's necessary but pressure also to force them to create policies that serve us and also to provide them with models and also be able to say to them no we can't do this here. And so until we get to the point where we can work together, and I think we're moving in that direction in terms of educating ourselves, then we're going to continue to be upset if we don't begin to start identifying alternative models, working together and figuring out how we stop them. And at the same time, I think, you know, when you start working toward models and educating yourself and involving young people and other people, that is education. That is an alternative. I feel like, you know, which... You know, when we elect people, yes, maybe we should expect them to do certain things when they don't. But I feel like, me, I don't put a lot of faith in the political system. I kind of like civil. But I do understand that it affects our lives and that we need to understand it and be strategic about it and how to change it. But I do feel like we can't rely on that to fix our problems. We have to fix our problems. We have to figure out how to do it. We have to figure out what we want. And we have to work together to bring it about. And so there are alternative models, and I'll just say, which I haven't got to look at it yet, but uh, somebody was saying that Michael Moore's movie, The Next Place in Bay, has a lot of examples in other countries of how they address issues like housing, education, those kind of things. So there are models here in this country, and there are models elsewhere. But I think we have to really educate ourselves and then start you know, figuring out how to impact the system and how to bring about what we want. That's what I'll say. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm Hambana and I'm a, a factory. The thing about the power, uh, you know, Sean, um, show us what you need because um, part of my community is in the regional center downtown. Part of it's in another community. But um, every time we used to go to the city, I would always say, We heard you guys are planning to do something. And they said, Yeah, we are. Well, what's your plan? We didn't have a plan. So that was a big drawback for us. It was really, it took us a long time to try to get it right. But now, <coughs> uh, what we have were, and I lived in one community, but I have an affinity for where I grew up at and down in the neighborhood. So I don't live there. there. I really don't have a big vote because that's like I don't live there. But um, right now, the person who's following of our organization, she's somebody that moved in the neighborhood probably eight or ten years ago. And now people are starting to move in, and you know, the liquor store is going in, and this place is there, and everything is there. And we have to just, you know, things that you were moving into. And, you know, they are, uh, well, we want to be closer to work in school. And, and, I have been going to the local neighborhood organization, but we've got a city council person, we've got a big liaison, and then the public that I interview people come all the time. And for a long time, I was like, I really understand and like to believe them, but then I kind of see them being on the side of our neighborhood president. And um, him and my mom always speak up, we do have a lot to say. We are very not a lot of residents out there because part of it's industrial and then part of it's residential. But what um, I met with one or two other people, so we're going to start just doing some things on our own. That's our community. We're going to have like a, um, you know, take some power to a block party, uh, do some porch parties, national night out, just kind of starting to connect the you know, uh, 
people in this room would rather be the one who was the last. The new people coming in want to say. If we don't have right now, we don't have the big voices. That's something we want to do. That's what's going to happen in life here and throughout. So we just just not known. But um, just to make the change, the power's there with the people that are in office right now. I know to make my great examples of everything that I see in the justice support it, but I don't have the big voice there. So, Kind of, you know, go door to door, just grassroots things, and um, just you know, try to help figure it out. And since we're in the regional center, um, just like you guys were saying, the developers come to the meeting last year, get and they let all these uh, people. I mean, little school, like twice as full as this. And half the people didn't even know what we were talking about. We got a little park out there. Here, 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 here. And I asked people, they got the moments. I said, well, what are you guys using it? And they had, they were just wanting to get in on something. So you really are, you know, it really is just to start taking part. They're just part of the party, 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 national out, night out. They have a neighborhood organization, but some other people were just kind of like, start going on with it. Thanks for your support. Yeah, I hate capitalism. <laughs> but uh, okay, so I grew up in the late sixties, the early seventies, and we grew up in a house that you would make a slightly better shack. I mean, if you know anything about OJ, you know they had a place in house like this. I mean, this was like a tar paper frame house. No indoor commons, no one in one. We had a lot of house too. We go to all that. So there were some friends of ours, a family that were going to build a nice house out of the country, what was the country back then? And they asked all the members of the church if they were going to build their house. Well, my father wanted to help these people build a house that was better than the one we lived in. And he didn't think it was to help them do that. Now, if I had $3,500 and went and bought one of these the like houses that the city had, could I get anybody in the room to come and help me fix this house? You know what I'm saying? That way, we all become a developer. You know what I'm saying? And no evil outside comes in. I don't understand black unification. That's not just like the first place. I don't understand. I'm saying that, like, I saw our home Right? 
that if I'm hoping to revitalize my neighborhood, I cannot be a gentrifier. Gentrification says has resources tied to it. We were here, we had the resources, we left and we took them with us. Now we're back and we're going to benefit from cheap land values and housing prices and all that kind of stuff. And we're going to bring the resources that are going to push everybody who's here out. So you're, 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 when they left, they went to cheap land prices and all that stuff. Or, you know, so it, 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 everywhere, everything about it says it's a benefit. For somebody that does not look like you, I don't know how much education you got, you think it's still black, right? So I don't think we should make it that way. No, no, because it's way much more complicated. And yes, people who would just like to come come back to the neighborhood and push the other people who don't have the resources to stay out. And they can do it because they don't want to live next door to JJ or whoever. They want to live next door to Renard. So I think the part that we forget is that much of education is a more complicated. If you choose to come to a place that I'm going to revitalize this neighborhood, I want to be sure that those who are here benefit from whatever I bring, or you're like, ooh, I drive down 38th Street. There's no businesses here. It's just not with your own business. It's just businesses that you. And that's a different perspective on how you work in a neighborhood. So if you walk into a process and say it's all of us or none of them, or you say every man will sit off and call, some of you are just going to be having and those are the moral processes, the moral compasses that we're going to be here. Here we go, we're going to be here for about somebody who is just like me. We're going to be right over here in Mickelson Hall Creek and get to fire right over here across the street. He hasn't really said anything about how do I ensure that as I get this 20 year tax credit to put up these property taxes and take money out of the tip fund, you know, build this, but not put money back into that fund for the next two decades. So he's not really different than the, we have issues around race and class, but we can't talk about the issues that just to the class and maybe not the racial aspect. In regards to the power, everyone needs to ask power. What I encounter is lots of neighborhoods get the power away. We can't do nothing. You can do a lot if you work together, but if your first beginning discussion is I can't do nothing because it's just one little old lady. You know what? One, if that person works that job, they can go to make the 60 meetings. You get 100 neighborhood residents, y'all go to 100 meetings. And I'll do it. I'll go to two, y'all go to 200 meetings. And I'll do that one person that has been sent to the neighborhood to work right here and there. But if you start with the process that you can't do anything, you've already lost the war. You've got to start with, okay, let me go find people just like me. We're not happy with what's happening. So we can work together, but we've got to have a game. And the typical clues is that, oh, I'm upset. Okay, you're upset. We're going to do that. We're going to have a game for you. We're going to have to okay, we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. So you're always running behind somebody who's two steps ahead of you instead of running the race to the end and getting to the So, yeah, people were just like, I can make a couple of decisions. I'm doing exactly right, but it doesn't have to be done. Oh, I think he's trying to say something. Oh, yeah, one second. Okay, go ahead. Okay, this is a very, very good thing here. Um, I'm catching quite a bit of it, but not all of it. And I just want to make a couple of quick comments. I'm hearing from things over and over again. The most recent is about resources. And that's it. It was valuable resources. Number one, money and politics, political. And here's what I mean by that. Um, let's look at, first of all, forced desegregation. Desegregation is not the friend of the black community that many people think it was. Okay. This is from Oklahoma back in the 1920s, Tulsa Greenwood. We had this black community. A lot of money. 
they had their own businesses. I mean, it was a very, pretty much a self-contained black community. They referred to Black Wall Street was there. A lot of money flowed through this community and it was, it was in the hands of blacks. Uh, there were a number of things that happened that, that they brought me. Um, but let's think of some of the many communities that prior to desegregation of the 1960s. Um, going back to my hometown of Baltimore, there were thriving black communities along Pennsylvania Avenue and North Avenue, which is the same community where Freddie Brick was arrested and eventually died in police custody. You know, where we have vacant home after vacant home after vacant home, high crime rate, and all the problems that come with that, and the lack of jobs and the poor educational systems. Education is another uh, common theme that I'm hearing in your discussion. So think about these communities that used to thrive, that used to do very well. Now think about, again, resources of money and politics. For instance, in Baltimore today, in Freddie Gray's community, which is the zip code is 21217, the same zip code that I grew up in and the same zip code where my mother still lives. What they don't have in that community today is they don't have political power, they don't have money. So therefore, that community is wide open and subjected to identification. There is absolutely nothing that can stop them. Many of these communities that we're talking about don't have either one of these resources, these two resources. Doesn't mean they can't take you know, resources and capital. But something has to happen. An effective government is local government. And unfortunately, there's no way around this political piece right now for the short term solutions. What you need to do first is organize. So you need a very, very strong community organization. One that control uh, is the yeah. and greatly influence who's going to be elected as mayor in that particular city or town. Currently, on average, only 18 to 34, 35 percent of the voting population in this country votes. It depends on whether it's a presidential election or not. But that's a very, very small number of people who actually go to the ballot. If you can organize strong community association, get people to vote, energize your young people, educate your young people, I'm telling you, you can control at least that media community where you don't want this to happen. An example of where this is, has happened is in uh, Champaign or Urbana, Illinois, where you have a very small group of folks who organized put their, their, their choice people into city council seats, eventually into state government, and they're controlling their neighborhood and community. And with that political control, now you can get jobs into your community. You can begin to effectively encourage businesses to come in the way the way you right? And along with that, when jobs come, start bringing the money into your community. So, first, if in your community by organizing strong community organizations, and then after that, you put in the money part of the resources, and then you can make things happen. The education that needs to happen, continue job growth, continue small business, start and manage their own business in, within your community. Control not just gentrification within your community, but control many other important things such as housing, such as education, health related issues. Uh, I just wanted to make those quick comments for you. Well, we're going to have to take some more questions. Uh, um, I Right now, today, today, your CDC, your community development corporation, institutions, got money. They want to rebound the house or bring somebody in from the moon or someplace, capital someplace to develop it. I'll get this. Develop it once. Black white people. 
on the phone.
medication we can get to our own community, just like there are there are um, uh, education, uh, housing, helping each other, there's housing for food and growing food and, and sharing with each other. So how do we uh, take these this understanding of these kind of things and then use it to influence how we can then make decisions in our lives mm -hmm. and talk? Uh, I'm Michelle. This is Margot. We're going to introduce the sort of event that we're holding at today. We'll be showing a short video, it's a documentary that explores the nature of food justice in Indianapolis or food injustice. So it looks at different problems that community members are here right now uh, identify. And then it looks quickly at some community driven initiatives to help solve those injustices. And then it also goes to a short discussion about mindfulness and a lot about what Elvin was just talking about, about identifying community, community food, and how to have those conversations, how to identify the interests, and I guess bridging it for transcending the great community. So we will then, after coming to the film, have a little discussion. About food justice, and then that's also a very aspect about identifying with your community and its your involvement. So that's what we have. We're going to sit, just stick around. Yep. And we'll have about right here, um, and then it'll be 20 minutes long, and uh, followed by the group discussion, and we'll have. Wow. Exactly. Uh, so it's wow. a collaboration between the community and us. So as you know, AI loves education and empowerment. It's a project of education all the time, right? We're pretty much everybody involved, including us, because we got to learn how to edit film. <laughs> <laughs> Are we kind of closing now? Yeah, okay, I want, I want to say something about, uh, well, uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank you all for coming out, but I want to also share that um, KI is an organization that uh, exists because of your support. And you allow us to do the things that we do, like have these conversations. We also have after school programs and summer camp. So at the front table, some of you might have seen the link list about the summer boot camp that's coming up. And we're currently trying to uh, raise money to provide urban kids with scholarships to attend the summer camps. It's three weeks uh, in June and three weeks in July. And they'll learn about science, technology, engineering, soil science, how to do robots how to do video game animation and video editing. And so we are just asking for your support. If you can make a contribution, you know, we really need it. You can spread the word and let others know. And we're also uh, looking for young people who might benefit from the camp. So there's information on there about how to sponsor a scholarship or where to go to sponsor a scholarship and where to go to register a young person. So we really value your support and would love to have it. So, uh we are a uh, organization that drives a lot that kind of support that allows us to maintain a good voice and all for a critical conversation. Uh, I'm hoping that all values and support is a decent conversation. Mid-stride, you want to go down town square, it's fully blown gentrification. We 
we walk across the street and they're at the beginning stage. It will give you an idea of what it can look like in a neighborhood that's consistent with the to provide. And on top of that, if you have my card, let me know when you can continue. We're looking to continue these discussions in our race class and panel by having a monthly discussion with business justice race using the Charleston syllabus. Reading articles from there that have community discussions facilitated just around race. So if that's something you think you might be interested in, just meet me over there. If everybody should have a card in the choir, you know how to find me. And I think you're coming out today. Well, let's get ourselves around the fall line. Good luck to you all. Uh, I really like what you're doing. All the best. I wish you the greatest success. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.